Well, good morning and welcome. We're glad to have you with us for our Bible study time this morning as we look into the Word of God and continue our studies in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And here we are this Sunday before Thanksgiving. And as we walk into this week leading towards Thanksgiving, uh, I hope that you have a great week uh, of just reflection on the many ways God has met your needs, God is meeting your needs, and, and the way that God will continue to meet your needs as you thank him for the many ways that he has worked in your life for you and through you and around you. And, and uh, we, we just pray that this will be a great celebration for you, for your family, for whoever that you're with. And of course, we'd love to see you here uh, at 10 o'clock in the building for our Thanksgiving service next Sunday. We'd love to have you along for that if you can make it. Uh, otherwise, we'll be here uh, online with our Thanksgiving message uh, for next Sunday. We'll resume this study uh, the week after. So thank you again for joining with us. If there's a need in your life that we can help meet, please let us know. We'd love to be a part of, of helping you and walking with you in any way we can. If it's answering a question, uh, if it's uh, praying with you and for you, uh, listening to something that you've got going on in your life and you want to talk about, uh, we're here for you. So please connect. Uh, that's our privilege to walk with you and to help you. Well, as we begin this morning, let's turn to the Lord in prayer and then we'll uh, get into the Word of God this morning. Father, we thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for forgiveness and life in Christ. We thank you for uh, your Word to steer our steps, to renew our minds, to, to show us who you are and what it means to walk with you. We thank you for your Spirit uh, to, to come and to guide us and to uh, show us the truth of your Word and to bring that truth to bear on our choices and decisions as we walk with you. We thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ and the privilege it is uh, to be a church family and to walk together with you and to serve you together. And now as we look into your word, we come to you with uh, open hearts and open ears. We're listening and we pray that you would speak to us, help us not to miss what you have for us today. But we also come to you with the burdens of our hearts. We have financial needs, people looking for work, people needing provision for their families. We, we have physical needs with a lot of illness, treatment, surgeries, tests, and waiting for test results. Uh, Father, we pray for strength and uh, help in walking through and facing these challenges. Show us how to be an encouragement to each other. Uh, Father, those that are grieving loss, those that have major decisions ahead of them, uh, those that are dealing with relational struggles, Father, we ask for you to meet the needs of every heart as we gather together here. We look at our world and we pray for those in the southeastern U.S. that are struggling with the aftermath of this hurricane. Father, we pray that you would meet their needs, encourage their hearts, and, and again, show us and the people around them how to reach out and help. And uh, Father, we pray that you would strengthen them today. We look at, at Israel, Lebanon, Gaza, uh, all that's going on there. We think of Ukraine and all that's happening there. And Father, we need peace we need peace. We pray for righteousness and truth and justice and peace. And Father, we pray for your work in and amongst the nations of the world. And as we wait and as we watch, we trust you. Help us to rely on you and to rest well at night, knowing that you have this well in hand. You are in control and you rule the nations. And Father, we pray that through it all, whatever we're facing, whatever we're talking about with friends, families, and neighbors, that you would lift our hearts and our eyes to you and use this to remind us of our great need and of our great Savior. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you'll be gathering, no doubt, around a table of some kind, a family table, next weekend for Thanksgiving. And you'll have a, a dinner of some kind with family, friends. Um, we, I hope that that's your experience. Um, we will certainly be doing that with our family. Uh, we also today, here in the building, will be gathering around the church family table, the communion table. And when we think of the family table and family tables, we, a few things come to mind. The first is they're not formal and they're not fancy. Ooh, every once in a while you might shine up the old, the new china, the old china, you know, grandma's old china, bring it out, and hey, that's great. But it's not formal and it's not fancy. Uh, it, when you eat family style, what does that mean? It means the potatoes are over there. Have some and pass them along. It, it, just, hey, here we are. The food's on the table. The people are around the table. And, and let's engage in this together. 
The family table is not a drive through where somebody just runs through, loads up their plate and says, oh, I'll be on my own, I'll talk to you later. Uh, the family table is not a silent place where everybody just mopes or where everybody's on their phones instead of engaging. No, we put that stuff away. It's a, it's a place of noise, isn't it? It's a place where we enjoy the meal together, but we also engage with each other in the process. And that's a huge part of it is sharing this time as well as this food uh, together. And so it's a time of family conversation where we talk about the needs on each other's hearts and lives, the, the, the blessings, the encouragements, the struggles. We talk about it all. And, and hopefully we're talking about the Lord and pointing each other to the Lord in and through it all. Well, we come to this passage this morning that I think is appropriate for a communion service and for a family gathering on your mind coming up. It just reminds us as we come through First John and we work our way through chapter 2 now, uh, it just reminds us of our connection with each other, what we share together as God's family, as brothers and sisters in Christ, his rescued and adopted children. So let's look together at First John chapter 2. We'll begin in verse 7. And the first thing we notice here is that we gather together around the table. Take a look. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. And at the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John begins this section with the word beloved. Now we looked at last week in chapter 2 when he moved from that apostolic we. This is a position of authority, the message I've been sent with, the ministry I've been entrusted with. And that's all true as he speaks to his readers. But at the same time, he made that a shift then in chapter 2 verse 1 to my little children it's more of a pastoral connection I love you I've led you to Christ I care for you I'm looking after you I'm here to shepherd and guide you you, you, you are the burden of my heart and that's what he's talking about and now he uses this word beloved and he will use this six times now throughout the rest of this particular letter it's a word that speaks of his heartfelt love his deep care and and serious concern for them and he says, Beloved, I'm writing you no new commandment. This is an old commandment. What commandment? Well, the commandment to love each other. That's where he's going in this passage. I'm not writing you a new commandment. You've had this from the beginning. So well, what do you mean? Well, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, in the giving of the law to God's people uh, through Moses, you have this. Verse 18 of Leviticus 19. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I am God. I am giving you this command. This is what you're to do. You're to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, in, in Matthew chapter 22, you remember that, that Jesus was teaching and a, a group of Pharisees gathered, these religious leaders and teachers, and they were trying to trip him up and trap him in his words. And, and he came and he said, they said, okay, um, uh, we've got a few different religious uh, groups here. So we can get him to, to divide the, these groups in terms of their support of him. And we, he'll split us down the middle and that'll be great. Half the people will walk. Jesus, what's the most important commandment? Of all the commandments given, what's the most important? Well, Jesus answered right away without a second thought. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That comes from the Shema, from, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. But then he says, a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything holds together on this, that you love God with all that you have, all that you are, first and foremost, above everything else. And secondly, that you love your neighbor as yourself. How would you want to be treated? How do you care for yourself? Think that way of the people around you. Love the people around you that way. Reach out to people around you that way and be motivated and guided by that. So this is an old command. 
Jesus was quoting Leviticus. The people had had this for a very long time. They were familiar with this. John says this isn't a new command. And yet, in John chapter 13, around the communion table, Jesus said this, around that Passover supper. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so also are you to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's John 13, 34 and 35. You say, well, John said it's not new. But Jesus said at the communion table, that at the Passover dinner, that, that this, is, this is a new commandment. Well, what is it? Well, it's both. Is it new or not? Yes, it's not new. It's old. Love your neighbor. But it's new in its quality, not in the timing of it. We've had this command for a long time, but in the quality of it. There is now a, a, a new depth, a new uh, fresh depth to this command never seen before. Because before, what was the old command? Love your neighbor as yourself. As you would care for yourself, love your neighbor. What did Jesus say to his followers around that table the night before he went to the cross? Love one another as I have loved you. You're to love one another as I have loved you. How did he love us? How did he love his people? Well, he had just loved them by serving them. He got down on the floor on his knees and did the worst job, usually reserved for the worst, the lowest servant in the house. Here's what he did. He washed their feet. He served them. He served them. And he said, you, now that you've seen what I've done here, you need to do this too. You need to serve each other. He says, you need to love each other as I've loved you. Humble service, putting others first, meeting their needs. That's what he had just done. And he's just about to go to the cross and die for them. Complete self-sacrifice for their good. You're to love one another as I have loved you. Not just as you love yourself, but take it to another level now. Love each other as I have loved you. With hum humble service and complete total sacrifice. Give of yourself for each other. Love each other this way. The question comes, how will people see the love of God in our world today? It's in us and through us as we love each other as followers of Christ, as brothers and sisters in Christ, as a church family. He says that in John 13, 35. That's how people are going to know you're my disciples, if you love one another. Well, how will we see the love of God to know if we're loving each other properly and appropriately? We see it in Christ. As he washes feet, as he dies on the cross, he is, as John says, the true light who was now shining. He's the true light in John 1 who's come into the world. And now here in 1 John 2, he's the true light who is shining. It is his love, his example that we follow, that we model ourselves on, that we obey. This is, this is how we know what true love is, and this is how we live it out. This is the true light that was shining, even Jesus himself. Well, let's look closer at this, because now that we have that in mind, that, that this is an old command, love your neighbor, with a new qualifier to it, a new depth to it, as I have loved you. Take a look at what he continues to say. Verse 9. Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoa. If you don't love as I'm commanding you to, you're still in darkness. You're not living in the truth. You're not living in the light. We saw that last week. And this is a reflection and a filling out of chapter 1, verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is an example now. He's saying, you, you want to know real life examples of this? If you say you're walking in fellowship with God, if you're saying that you're walking with God, but you're living in the darkness, if you say you know God, if you say you love God, and that you're in the light, but you hate your brother, you're actually still in the darkness. Whoa. Verse 10, whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there's no cause for stumbling. Yep. Hey, if you love your brother, then you're in the light. You're living in the light, walking in the light, practicing the truth. Verse 7 of chapter 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. That's verse uh, 7. 
Back to verse 6 in chapter 1 is reflected in verse 11 here. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You think you're in a light, but you're so it's so dark, you're blind, you don't even know where you're going. You're stumbling around in the dark if you hate your brother. So here's what he says. We are to love each other as followers of Christ, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Our love for each other to the depth and degree that Jesus loved us his type of love for each other, that's what we're commanded to. And without loving each other this way, we're walking in the darkness. No matter how good a game we talk, the proof is in the pudding, and we are not walking in the light. This is huge. This is huge. First uh, Corinthians chapter 13 tells us this. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, I'm even murdered. But I have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is what we're talking about here. And this is what John paints this picture for us. To love is to walk in the light. To hate is to still be walking in the darkness. This is a huge indication of where we stand, isn't it? And this is the question of our series. Are you sure? Are you sure that, that you're the real deal as you're following Jesus? Well, our love for each other in the church family is God's audiovisual presentation to the world. This is my love. This is how I love for you. This is how Jesus loved you. Come and experience this kind of love. Our love for each other in the church is also an indication that we ourselves are in the light. So it's a message to those out there, an indication to those out there of the love of God. And it shows us that the love of God is, is in our hearts and that we are actually in the light. Our love for each other is another indication of life, of assurance, of our salvation, our forgiveness, and our eternal life in Jesus. We're walking in the truth and in the light when we're walking in love with each other. He says in chapter 2, verse 3, by this we know we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. What's one of his commandments? John 13. Love one another as I have loved you. Chapter 2, verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. Love each other as I have loved you. His type of love. Verse 11. Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness. Friends, we... If we want an indication whether we're walking in the light and truly following Jesus, how's our connection with our brothers and sisters in Christ? How's our love for each other in the church family? It's huge, huge. Well, as we think of a family table, we think of the communion table as a church family or, or Thanksgiving table as a family table. We come together. It's we, together. We come together. It's not just about food. It's not just about an act. It's not just about a, a, a worship service. It's about doing this together. This is huge. Well, let's continue on. What do we do when we're together? Well, we reflect on what we have in Christ. Why is John writing this book? Well, two of the reasons he's given so far in chapter 1 verse 4, he says, so that our joy may be complete because we'll rejoice when you come to Christ and follow him and share fellowship with us in Christ. In chapter 2 verse 1, he says, I'm writing so that you may not sin. Here he says, not just why am I writing, but why am I writing specifically to you? Why is this letter coming to you and down through the centuries to us? Well, he says this. First, he says, I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. That's in chapter, verse 12. Down in verse 13, he says, I write to you, children, because you know the Father. He repeats these things three uh, twice, these three things. So he says, children, new followers of Christ, you who are, are just new to this, just experiencing this for the first time, and you're just starting, beginning to walk with God, to walk in truth and light in Christ. Um, uh, you are forgiven. Remember that you are forgiven. Your sin is gone. It is gone. Forgiven. Pardoned. You are guilty, but it was pardoned. 
given, uh, forgiven, removed because of Jesus. And because of Jesus, your sin is forgiven, but you also know the Father. You've been rescued, adopted into his family because of Jesus. You are forgiven. You are in fellowship with the Father because of Jesus Christ. Never forget that. Never forget that. We have forgiveness and we have adoption into the family because of Jesus. Then he says, young men, you, you who have been walking with the Lord for a while and you've, you've been in the thick of it, you're, you're in the battle, you're in the spiritual battle, you're serving, you're, le you're learning, you're growing. He says, I'm writing to you, young men, verse 13, because you have overcome the evil one. Again, in verse 14, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Because you are growing in your experience of understanding the Word of God. You're studying the Word. The Word of God is within you. It is shaping your mind. It's renewing your mind and transforming your life. You're now seeing things as God does. You're now valuing things the way God does. You are now reacting the way God would have you to do. You are now choosing to act and interact and so on as God would have you to do. You are walking in the light and in the truth because the truth is in you. And you are becoming strong because of that. And you're standing strong in his might and with his uh, armor, according to Ephesians 6. And you are now overcoming the evil one. Why? Because you know truth. And when he brings his lies to you, you stand on and with the truth. And you fight back with the truth. And that's what's going on in your life. And you're seeing this spiritual growth and this victory over sin. This is amazing. Children, new followers, you are forgiven. And you now have a father because of Jesus Christ. Young men, you've been, you've been growing and learning and the word's in you and now because of Jesus, the word's in you and it's taking root and it's bearing fruit in your life and it's providing this strength and this, this uh, opportunity to stand against the attacks of the evil one. And I'm writing to you, fathers, older folks, people who've been walking with God for a long time, you've been following Jesus for a lot of years. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Verse 14, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. What is this all about? Guys, I'm writing to you because you know him. You, you don't just know about Jesus. Yes, you've read about him. Yes, you've learned about him, who he is, what he does, what he has said, those kinds of things. You've learned those things. It's important that you learned about him. But beyond that, in walking with Jesus all these years, Yes, you know you're forgiven. You know that you have a fellowship with the Father because of Jesus. The word has taken root and, and allowed you to stand firm and to live righteously, to walk in the truth and the light in following Jesus. But over that time, you have learned not just about Jesus, you know him now personally. You've seen him at work. He has walked with you. He has led you. He has shaped you. He has provide for, provided for you. You know his presence. You know him. You know Christ. You know the Father because of this fellowship that you have in Christ. As we reflect on what we have in Jesus, whatever stage you're at in your walk with God, however long you've been following Jesus, we have these things that are ours to share, to rejoice and to thank God for, for what he's done for us in Christ. Oh, I wish I knew God the way that guy does. You keep walking with God and you one day will. You one day will. I wish I could stand strong the way that guy does. You keep walking in the word. Keep following Jesus, the one who has forgiven you and the one who has led you to the Father. You keep trusting him and following him and allowing his word to sink in. And, and, and you will. He will bring you along. And so we look together at the work of Christ for us and in us. We look together at the word of God active in us. We think of the spirit of God within us and with us. We think of the people of God with us. And we look at all that we have in Christ and we say, thank you, thank you. And we share this. It isn't just that I have this or that you have this. There are people in the church family at all these different stages spiritually, all these different experiences of walking with Jesus for different periods of time. But we come together and we share this together and we love each other as we walk in the light together. And together we reflect on what we have in Jesus. And it's an amazing thing. But it's not merely a feel-good moment. There's also to be an impact to this. There's also to be some follow through. And that's what takes us to verse 15. So do not love the world or the things in the world. If the, anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
Now, how is John using the word world here? Because in John 3, he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yes, he loved the people of the world that he sent his son to rescue us. This is talking about the world system, the cosmos, the world system, its, its agendas, its, uh, its attitude towards God, its, its position, all those things, its focus, what it worships itself. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't love the world and also God himself. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I need to remind us today that the world cannot and will not give you what you need because it cannot. What you need is forgiveness in life through Jesus. You need someone to lead you back to the Father, to a place of reconciliation with him. And verse 13 reminds us that's what he's done for you. Or verse 12, rather, that's what he's done for you. He, he has brought you to, uh, to this place of forgiveness and of knowing the Father. That's what he's done. But if we love the world, the world's never going to be able to give you that because it cannot. It's fundamentally opposed to that, in fact, working against that, leading away from that. So if you love the world, you love that which is opposed to the Father and leading away from him rather than the one who has rescued you and reconciled you to the Father and brought you back to him. So do not love the world. He then says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world cannot give you what it promises. And so as we gather together and we reflect on what we have in Christ, we're also reflecting on the false advertising. The world cannot give you what you truly need and the world cannot give you what it promises. Uh, the lust of the eyes, the desires of uh, sorry, the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, our appetites, whatever they may be. It could be food. It could be sex. It could be other experiences. It could be what we wear. It could be all kinds of things. But the desires, the, the lust of the flesh, feed my appetites and my instincts. That, that's not from the Father. That's from the world. He speaks about the desires of the eyes. So he goes from the appetites to to the appeal and the affections. Oh, that looks so attractive to me. If only I had that. If only I experienced this. If only that were true of me. Oh, life would be good. No, it's all a mirage. It's all a distraction. It's, it's just a false front like on those old Western movies where it looked like there's a town, but it's just cardboard standing up there. That, that's, that's what we're talking about. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the desire of the flesh and the eyes, and the pride of possessions. Oh, but look at what I have. Look at what I've achieved. Look at what I've attained. Look what I've collected. Look at what I've experienced. Look at this. And he's speaking now to our ambitions, our appetites, our affections, and our ambitions. This is what it's all about. This is what I want. Think about this. This is incredible. He says, this is not from the Father. But it's from the world. And the world cannot give you what it promises. It will leave you hollow. It will look good, but it will leave you hollow and empty and actually lead you further into its rebellion against God. That's Genesis chapter 3. Remember Eve in the garden? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, we're told this in her discussion there with the serpent. So when the woman saw that the, saw that the tree was good for food, there's the appetite, the flesh, and that it was a delight to the eyes. There's the eyes, the appeal, the attraction. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. There's the pride. She went for it. You see how it's just the same pattern all along. The world promises these things it cannot deliver. And so we reject that false advertising. The world is passing away, verse 17, along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The reason the world can't give you that which lasts forever is because the world itself is falling apart, decaying, condemned, and it is passing away. It will not last forever. So how can it possibly give you something that it doesn't even have itself? All, eternal life can only be found in Jesus because he's the one who has it. He's the one who rose again and, and, and offers us forgiveness life. Why? Because he can. The world can't offer you that. Why? Because it doesn't have it. It's decaying and rotting away itself. The world cannot and will not last, and it cannot help you to last. And so we gather together at Thanksgiving, we gather together at communion, 
And we come together, loving each other as we walk in the truth and the light, because we're sharing together as brothers and sisters in Christ that relationship with our adopted father, being rescued and placed in his family. <sighs> we're brothers and sisters in Christ, and so we love each other. We reflect on what we have in Christ. Oh, but they have that out there, but they experience that out there, but they collect that out there. Who cares? Look at what we have in Christ. Look at it. Forgiveness, relationship with the Father, spiritual strength, the ability to, to walk and follow Him in righteousness, the privilege of knowing Him, of truly coming to know God through fellowship with Him and His Son. Look what we have. So we look at what we have in Christ and through Christ and with Christ and look at what we have Together, it's not just me, it's not just you, it's us. Together we have this. And so we have this in common with his people, and that makes his people our people. And we connect it as a family. So are you grateful for and satisfied with what God has provided for you in Christ? Or are you distracted, still chasing after the things of the world? Are you grateful for and satisfied with and loving the people that God has placed you with in his family? Or are you still stumbling in the darkness? Because there's no way I'm getting along with that. There's no way I'm loving them. There's no way. Do you know what they're really like? Hey, they're a child of God. They're your brother and sister. If you are a child of God, if you're in the light, if you're hating them and you're just refusing, it shows you're still in the darkness. Friends, do you truly love the God who loved you first? Do you truly love the true and living God? loved you enough that when you rebelled against him, he sent his son to rescue you and adopt you into his family? If we love the world, the love of the Father's not in us. If the love of the Father's in us, we won't love the things of this world and be distracted by all that, our appetites and the things that attract us and the, our ambitions. Instead, we'll love him, we'll walk in the truth and the light, and we'll do it together. We'll love each other, those that he has also rescued. And we'll do this together. So as we listen to John and examine our hearts and honor Christ through this study, let's walk in the truth and the light and love as we follow Jesus together. We, together as followers of Jesus, we've been forgiven through Christ. And so we need to love each other as that family adopted into God's family. And this love needs to be stronger and deeper than disappointments and disagreements. And so let's stand together. Let's walk together in the truth and the light as we follow Jesus together in the eternal life we have with the Father, in the fellowship we have with the Father and with each other through Jesus, if that's true of us, then let's live like it and let's love like it. I hope you have a good time this week around the family table as you connect with each other, as you reflect on the goodness of God and what you share together. But I trust that you find that deep, deep connection with God's people, that love for his family, your family, his people, now your people, because we've been adopted together by the Father through his son, Jesus.